Hello and welcome to Skeleton Songs. Spooky welcome. <laughs> Last time wasn't spooky enough, actually. We did get some comments from people saying it was interesting, but you lied to me. Did I? Well, I was unreliable. <laughs> hey. Well, today uh, is validated by both history and blood. Like all the best things. And this is very loosely themed, a, a gothic podcast. And... Uh, we were talking, Lottie and I, about some of our family background and realised how many peculiar tales of death, buried secrets, strange hats and um, attempted murder, <laughs> or possibly successful murder, uh, were involved in, in, in this. So if we I reckon that if you go far enough back, stories, um, everyone has a successful murder in their family history. Think that, about that's that. That's plausible, yeah. Right. I mean, Cain and Abel, right? I mean, the Bible if, says we're all descended, so... We may not gainsay the book. No. Do you want to go first with your... Because your family... I, I will warn listeners <laughs> that I'm slightly nervous about this episode because Alexis's family have a history of basically doing amazing things and being really interesting. And my family are totally obscure and we have occasionally whimsical anecdotes that we occasionally mention to one another. So Lottie's being typically modest and I think it's worth pointing out well, that. listeners As can all, judge. All our listeners will, will probably be able to think of at least one person in their family who's done something interesting or bonkers or both. But um, I, I guess the salient point here is that a lot of my family, up until my generation, were armed forces types particularly but not exclusively the Air Force and um, my great-grandfather my great-grandfather Algernon was he really called he Algernon? he was really called Algernon um, you see already he's winning and uh, my great-uncle Gilbert it's not as good as Algernon but it's still pretty good uh, were both in the Royal Flying Corps back when that was a thing so this is the First World War this is 1914 to 1918 and there was no Royal Air Force yet because there barely were any airplanes yet but in the outbreak of war uh, the it became apparent that aeroplanes were probably a good thing to be able to look down from if you wanted to see where troops and trenches were. And then it became apparent that um, if you had aeroplanes up there and the other side had aeroplanes up there, they might want to shoot at each other in order to discourage that. And then I think by the end of the war, they were strafing people and bombing people. But initially, it was the reconnaissance arm of the British Army, the RFC. And to be clear, I don't think your family ever did any of the strafing or the bombing, did it? I, they might well have. I've no idea. OK, well, I was so, trying to give you an out. But oh, no. I, 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 now, now yeah, well, you're another, another possible taint later. OK. But my grandfather and... Um, Great uncle, great grandfather, great uncle, who who are less posh than the name sound, I think. They sound really posh. They do, but they were sons of a dentist. Right. It wasn't like they were landowners. It's just, you know, this this was the 19 teens. And they both signed up um, like good, patriotic, enthusiastic English lads of the First World War. And fortunately for them, didn't end up in the meat grinder because although they signed up for the army, they um, volunteered very early on for the RFC. And the reason they volunteered for the RFC. Uh, the Royal Flying Corps is that that one of the officers said, "Oh, you two, you've you've got experience in aviation, haven't you?" And and Algernon kind of went, "Yeah, I do." Uh, and what he actually meant was that uh, he and his brother had been fans of aviation when they lived in Paris, where with, with my great 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 grandfather, um, great great grandfather was was a dentist in Paris, and um, they'd gone out to the aerodrome in order to go up in, in fact, just one trip. Uh, with uh, I think Blerio, the guy who flew over the channel, uh, because he was hiring his plane out just to take people up for trips. So that was the whole of their aviation experience. That's why they ended up in the RFC, and it probably helped them survive the war. Brave British soldiery, right there. But in fact, say say brave ironically, but one of the things that always alarms me about war is how fucking young everyone is. I was going to say I wasn't actually being ironic about the bravery. I think there probably are people in the army who have also. Uh, profess more experience than they yeah. have and maybe we shouldn't give them guns quite as early as we do but but I don't want to take away any of the bravery it takes to go No, well my, my <laughs> Algernon my great grandfather uh, wrote a book about his experience at the beginning he says he, he went into a recruiting office and filled in the form and gave it to the recruiting office and the recruiting officer read it and gave it back and said I, I think you'll need to make a small adjustment before we can take you because he was only 17 and he needs to be 18 before he could sign That's up That's ridiculous so. isn't it? Anyway, so they both they both uh, got into these absurdly dangerous flying machines, which were still, I think, you know, less dangerous than marching through mud into the teeth of machine gun fire. And Gilbert 
did very well for himself. He um, uh, he got shot down, which wasn't doing well for yourself, but it, but it happened. Um, and he landed under fire just inside the British lines. And the Germans uh, objected to a British aeroplane being parked within shell range. They demonstrated their <laughs> objections by firing, apparently, about over the course of the night, 150 shells. Oh, my God. And uh, my great uncle and his mechanic uh, w- worked away through the night trying to repair the plane enough to get it back into the air while these shells were bursting around them. But there were no direct hits. Uh, and uh, by dawn, they had the plane in good enough shape That's that they managed to, to take off and fly home. I felt heroic when I did an all-nighted for an essay at university. <laughs> well, we live in a, a gentler age, thank God. We do. But uh, they, he got the Victoria Cross for that, which is the... Um, which is huge. Which is, yeah, the highest British thing for gallantry. And then, I once worked with a gentleman who um, was another uh, armed forces... Uh, air, all his family had been in in the military, and I once casually mentioned something about the Victoria Cross, and he knew every single um, person who had ever been awarded the Victoria Cross because it is that important to people. They respect it so much. If you get a Victoria Cross specifically, because it means that you have done something utterly badass. Well, some people get excited about about medals, but he got shot down again after that because you know the planes. <laughs> they were like, "We're taking the medal back." Low. Well, no, actually, they gave him another one. Was what? He got shot down, and he um. <laughs> And then while he was trying to repair the plane, a, a German came up behind him with a pistol. Uh, and, and so he, he surrendered. Um, Sensible lad. And he and his mechanic got taken away. And during the being shot down the second time, he got a piece of quite a large, apparently, sort of half a kilo uh, shell uh, trunk lodged in the base of his spine. So what? the Germans obligingly took that out for him and gave it to him to keep as a no, souvenir. No, you're getting this confused with Rimworld. You're always <laughs> sorting out people's spine in Rimworld, but this is the real so it didn't, world. So it didn't actually damage his spine. It just, you know, fortunately oh the spinal column God. protected it. Uh, and then he, he uh, tried to escape. Uh, and, <laughs> Limping away, uh, poor man. They, he didn't work. So he tried to escape again, uh, and it didn't work. Uh, and then he tried to escape a third time, and this time he came up with a plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was like this with the previous war. He modified his jacket, his flying officer's jacket, so that it looked when turned round. Um, like I'm not really clear that it was a German uh, officer's uniform or a, a civilian uniform. And he reversed it and sort of walked briskly out the front gate. I mean, this is has so much like chutzpah, like unbelievable. And then he, he, he managed to hike to Holland and... Um, Became Steve McQueen. <laughs> and stayed over the rest of the, the rest of the war, but they gave him the military cots uh, for that. And he stayed in the Air Force and got um, uh, ascended quite high in the end. But the other random exploit is he was... In 1925, the date, in fact, of the uh, cultist... Uh, Exile. DLC, I realised I was doing this. He was flying over Salisbury Street Plain on an exercise. He was... Um, squadron commander by them and they'd actually turned the RFC into the RAF by that point they combined the it's not interesting anyway uh, <laughs> but uh, and he noticed these peculiar pits in the ground formation of pits he took a photo um, moulds and dragons wo- woodhenge he discovered woodhenge he discovered woodhenge woodhenge uh, as you might guess from its name, was made of a less durable material than Stonehenge. <laughs> and then the wolf so, came and blew it down, and we had to build a Stonehenge So instead. it survives mostly as, as a series of pits in the ground. But yeah, he was a pioneer of uh, area archaeology. You see what I mean, listeners, about, like, it's quite a hard act to follow. And I think before we move on from, from him, yeah. um, his jacket, which is the reversible one, yes. I believe is, an, is a, on display... In, in, a London, in a yeah. London museum about the war, Imperial there's, there's, war there's a painting of him as well. Looking so really you can verify dashing. that this is not always a total bag of hot air <laughs> as a podcast. Anyway, so that's, that's him. Do you, want, do you want to do a story or do you want to move on to his son? Um, I think we should alternate. There you go. So um, my family come uh, either from... Um, they're either Geordies, which is people who, who aren't um, British, is basically the northeast of England. And we have, I have now learned, um, apparently the uh, most beloved British accent in 2008. Everyone says, Geordies are the best. And unfortunately, I have a very posh accent, so I don't sound like a Geordie at all. And I'm not going to impersonate one because I, my ancestral ghost will rise up and hit me around the head. But, but it's a lovely accent. Think of Anton Deck, if you've ever seen them. They're probably the most famous Geordies. Or the hairy bikers. Um, and Your the other side of the family. sounds a bit Geordie when she gets cross. And my grandma um, sounded very Geordie when she said certain words. She'd sort of speak like I speak, and then every so often she'd talk about a book. <laughs> and that was very confusing. Um, but that's uh, mum's side, and dad's side um, is, again, kind of posh sounding, but basically from Yorkshire. And he was born in the uh, 
brilliantly named town of Kirby Muxlow. So he didn't like that very much and we left and now we live in the posh south of England. But as a result, my family are not military or, like I said, particularly exalted stock. They've just kind of been bumbling around all their lives. Um, and Doesn't I had your a... name mean sheep stealer? Yes, well, uh, <laughs> Purdy, which is my mother's yeah. maiden name, literally does mean sheep stealer. Um, so maybe we were, you know, cat burglar sheep stealing infamous people. Um, and Bevan, my actual surname, my father's surname, simply means son of Evan. We come from the valleys, there's Welsh stock in us. Whereas Kennedy, to my uh, daughter's <laughs> lasting fury, uh, means something like ugly head. Big ugly head, Irish. doesn't it? Ugly head or helmet head or big head or something like that. <laughs> Which we will actually come back to later on in this podcast. Um, but yeah, so my great-great-grandfather wasn't a dentist, he was a baker. And his son hated it and didn't want to grow up and become a baker either because he just didn't fancy it. So what he did... Um, and this was sort of late 19th century, is he and his friends all got together and they all bought penny farthings. And they all decided that rather than, you know, sort of like an early gap year, I guess, rather than go straight into whatever um, discipline that, that the Lord had decided for them by who their parents were, they decided to essentially run away on their penny farthings and they cycled all the way up and down England. Um, and again, if this was... Um, from, from Geordie Lamb, which kind of um, Newcastle, Tyneside, that's the northeast of England, all the way down to the, you know, the Jurassic Coast at the south. Um, and every so often they'd stop and they'd fly their kites. And they'd get oh. on a penny farthing again and they'd trot along until the next kite opportunity. And they did that for, for basically a year until they got back to reality and had to be bakers. I want to do that. It's really sweet, isn't it? There is a slightly more apocryphal version of the story that I did try to research and couldn't find any evidence for, so I think it is apocryphal, that they actually tried to cycle on their penny farthings to Africa and they all died. But <laughs> I haven't seen any evidence of, you know, him living a long and happy life, so maybe they did that and what a way to go. That's my <laughs> story. <laughs> so, the second half of the, the, the Insel saga is David Insel. Um, Gilbert Insel's son so this is I, I'm never sure whether it's second cousin or something my mum's cousin anyway and um, that whole side of the family is eccentric in a good and slightly alarming way you're eccentric in and, a good and alarming way uh, I mean I just I don't have a patch on them. so David um, sadly um, he, he died a few years ago but he was an astonishing guy he alternated between being a sheep farmer um, near Bettersea Coyd in watch North out Wales. for my mum Yes, maybe maybe we're, we're destined, um, and a um, an environmentalist, um, or, or, um, and a I believe the the term he preferred was contract officer. Um, I'm sorry. It was a mercenary for the Sultan of Oman, uh, where he did a lot of his. Environmental I'm literally work. quitting this episode. <laughs> well, you you got the hat story, haven't you? Though? It's not a story. It's just lame. But go on about your amazing contract killer story. He wasn't mind. a cut. Excuse me. No, he was, so as far as I can tell. He was tell. James Bond. So the thing is, my, my uh, Gilbert Insel uh, was posted to... Again, it was weird seeing the, the history intersect. I was researching Manchester Iraq when, when um, Iraq, after it uh, was, was broken off from the uh, defunct Ottoman Empire, became a League of Nations protectorate and was put under the mandate of Britain. Um, and my great-uncle was posted there towards the end of his career. Fortunately, as far as I can tell, after the British government had stopped gassing and bombing the population to try to impose the Hashemite king on them oh, wow. uh, and was involved mostly in the Ikhwan rebellion which is a super interesting thing on its own but we need a whole for that. But, uh, so, so my family had this connection with the, uh, the Middle East and my mum actually was in uh, Bahrain for a bit under completely different circumstances. She was an air, air hostess. So but David? Kidnapped. But David, yes. Um, he had this connection with Oman. He, he got hired, I think, basically to train the army. So although notionally a mercenary, he wasn't being paid to go out and kill people. He's being paid to, to train troops and occasionally um, blow up um, uh, passes blocked by rocks. Uh, and then got involved in conserving rare Omani animals. My mother was in Bahrain at the time, uh, which isn't far. So he uh, visited her on occasion and they got quite close. And on one occasion, he, he was coming to a dinner party uh, and she, he rang her up and said, can I bring an extra guest? And she said, does he eat steak? And he said... <laughs> I love that as a first yeah. question. <laughs> yes. So she said, oh, OK, then I'll just make sure I've got some extra. And he turned up and he brought a wolf. No, he hadn't. He had brought an actual wolf. He had a dire wolf. This is James Bond and a dire no, wolf. No, it was... It was it I was, hate it, you. It was a wolf because, you know, uh, this was sort of rough and ready. What do you uh, mean it was a wolf, life, you know? 
He, it, it was, some, was it on a leash? It, uh, it was a baby wolf, apparently. My mum said it was like a wolf cub, but it was quite cute. But he just sort of found it. No, it was it was some sort of environmental thing where they'd been preserved. But you know, like I say, I don't think it's to be approved in terms of, of environmental protection, wildlife conservation, conservation these days. You can't just pick up a wolf. But I thought it was a foundling or what. But yeah, he bought it. He and it was sat at the table and had a steak. I don't know if it sat at the table. I asked my mum. I suspect they might have put a plate on the floor. That's ridiculous. But that, was, that was his thing. Anyway, and this is. He spent the rest of his life alternating between collecting wolves and looking after sheep. And he didn't get... I mean, firstly, that is a problematic spread of interests right there. Yeah. And secondly, he didn't get eaten by wolves, did he? That's not how he died. No, 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 no. He lived a long, happy life and died of whatever people die when they're old. Okay, fine. He tried very briefly to teach me to shoot when my mother and I... um, We used to go up to to, uh, the farm and stay with his family sometimes. And you being essentially Fotherington Thomas and and wanting to... Yeah, this is... Put this big thing next to my ear and I had to pull the trigger and bang and went up in the air and I didn't hit anything and I hated it. And I never never fired a gun again. (laughs) What's yours? Well, you mentioned it. Um, so uh, you've got a cool contract killer and a wolf. He's not. No, don't say the contract killer thing. It's actually a bit, a bit off. <laughs> but I thought that's what he meant by no, calling him contract a... officer as opposed to verse. It so sounds very. I know it does, but it's not. He wasn't sinister. paid to kill people. He okay. Paid to train people. Okay. Um... <laughs> well, I'll slightly revise what I was going to say then. Um, <laughs> my family has has no discernible sort of heirlooms or, or particular money or possessions to pass along. Like we're we're fine, but it's not like we have you know the the, the family mansion or, or uh, the, fa- the sort of Monet's or whatever it is. We do have one thing that is passed down generation to generation. Um, and uh, if you picture the scene in a dark dark corner of a dark dark house in a dark dark box, there's a small dark thing that can kill you, and that's what we pass down from generation to generation. And that thing is a poisonous hat. <laughs> um, and I'm sure many people have probably heard of um, the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. And this is actually erroneous, but a lot of people think that it was, uh, that Carol called him the Mad Hatter because of the famous link between making hats, originally making top mm. hats, that is, and madness. Um, and the reason for this is the process of, I've learned this now, the process of felting, which is essentially taking the fur, usually from a rabbit of um, a small animal, and processing it in a process that I now know is called carroting, which is great. Stick here for more hat making tips. Um, it, it used mercury, or um, more specifically, um, uh, mercuric nitrate. Mm-hmm. And these would release fumes that would slowly but surely drive whoever was making the hat mad and give them what is now called, um, what is it called? Oh, I can't remember. Er- 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 erytheum or something. Um, erythism, that's it. Right. All called Mad Hatter's disease. And uh, now we don't make top hats with mercury because we all know that it's super poisonous and it will definitely kill us and it's a disaster. But we have the ignorant outcome of pre-modern medicine hat and it's firstly very small i think everyone knows that people in the past used to be smaller than than they are now um but it's actually quite surprising when you find a sort of remnant from a bygone age and you realize like if i put that hat on i would look like a sort of steampunk beach ball you put it on your head it's very small well uh, i have actually put it on my head and mum said don't do that it's poisonous and then i took it (laughs) off my head and put it back in the box and i think every bevan goes through that at some point in their life um did it speak to you (laughs) <laughs> no, but it did put me in Slytherin. Right. So that was good. Um, yes, yeah, so it's very small. And then, of course, it is it is totally poisonous and we can never really touch it. So we can't look at it or touch it or open it or do anything with it. But we have it and that's fun. Ta-da! Ta-da. <laughs> well, I've shot my bolt. So I'm going to cheat. Because you, you, you've been building up my family as this um, hive of heroes. And actually, you know, like most families, it's only got a couple of, of, of notables in it. And so I'm going to go on to friends of the family who uh, have a connection I'll describe. Well, I was going to make some sort of tenuous discussion about the Gothic before we moved on to anything else. Yeah, go on. Well, just that I think it's interesting that, that, that you know, we're actually talking about roughly the right Gothic period, which mm. is to, to remind people kind of, what, 1880s to 1910s, maybe? Mm. Kind of 30-year period of high Gothicness. And, and realistically, it's more end of 19th century than, than start 20th. Yeah. But we can really... When well, you go all the back, back to, like, Radcliffe and... Do to the monk, didn't can't you? Yeah, yeah. So kind of what 18, 18 sort of thirties, forties. Yeah. But then when people think of like Jekyll and Hyde and stuff, that's kind you're of right. found a circular end of the nineteenth century. But but you're right. You know, it's, it's a long period of time, but but earlier than later. Um, and one of the stories that you've 
both the stories that you told all rely quite heavily on, on machinery, which is something that you never really see in Gothic literature at all. And it's certainly something that came in later into literary consciousness. I mean, I know famously um, Tolkien in The Lord mm. of the Rings. There's a lot of imagery that he puts in Lord of the Rings to do with, um, uh, you know, Mordor being full of all these sort of terrifying, fiery machines. And a lot of people say this is because he was in the First World War mm. and it was rubbish and machinery was used in an awful way. Um, and therefore he was this kind of bucolic minded writer who thought I love trees and I love bushes and I love shrubbery in England and I really hate big guns that shoot things and kill people and are on fire and that kind of became the imagery that 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 warred with each other in Lord of the Rings and I think it's interesting that that there obviously was this kind of uh, burgeoning of machinery going on in culture around the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century but gothic literature didn't seem to want to engage with that it seemed to want to kind of harken back to an earlier age you, you're right, and I think you know the other side of that is is family history and family legends. One of the things that that, that led us down this this path uh, are fundamentally gothic tropes. I was going to mention there's there's one gothic story I can think of which does have a machine in it, which is is unusual and, and long past the period of high gothic, high gothic, oh, whatever, uh, fantasy stuff. It's L. P. Hartley who wrote the Go Between and um, Facial Justice as generally a sort of um, minor literary novelist, but he wrote a bunch of gothic and ghost stories which are pretty good one of them is called the traveling grave and it's about a device that sounds amazing it's basically about a coffin that hides in the floor uh, but i i won't spoil it any more than that i love it uh, do you think it's interesting yeah i do think it's interesting and, and i guess i wonder if it's because there's more easier to hide the mystic side of life in something which doesn't have machinery i think a lot of the impulse which um entrained gothic literature as well sort of moved on into science fiction that's a good point and kind that of branched course got, out yeah kicked off so wells obviously was the, the great progenitor but not the only progenitor and and that is around the, the time of the overlap and i suppose i mentioned jekyll and hyde um and actually that is maybe the yeah. first kind of step in the branch because that of course is all about basically alchemy and science mm. changing these people rather than uh if we step back a bit we've talked previously on this series about um green tea shared in left news mm. story which is basically you know you drink this um exotic substance and it opens your inner eye and now we've moved on a couple you know decade or so and now it's about science has produced this substance which split this person into two different beings and then we get into the science fiction side of it yeah well there we go we solved it science Great. fiction go us you were saying i was saying um al pollock so my uh my father as people who've read the extracts uh from the autobiography from publishing was also in the air force and and had a, his own arc which is sufficiently horrible that i don't want to talk about it here uh but uh he, he died a long time ago and i visited uh, with my mother, the squadron uh, where he used to be stationed, uh, and they showed me the squadron diary that he'd been involved in in keeping up because there's a sort of informal thing that goes alongside the log, which has had sort of daft pictures of him being very young, getting drunk with other very young people. And then there was this odd picture uh, that he cut out a newspaper clipping with a cartoon on it, which was hung from, of a banner being hung from Tower Bridge in London. That said no hawkers the sign you normally see on doors you know I mean no people selling stuff and i looked around at people there and said what's what's that about and they all looked at each other and laughed a bit uncomfortably and they told me this story uh which i had a hard time believing and actually when i first looked it up it was quite hard to find online it's got a wikipedia entry and everything now so i, I guess it's true and the story is about a guy called Al Pollock, who was described as an extremely capable fighter pilot. He was a compatriot of my father's in the squadron. And in 1968, uh, there was a uh, celebration, uh, I suppose it'd be the 50th anniversary of the formation of the RAF, something like that. And um, they did a bunch of formation flying. But generally, Al Pollock felt uh, that the RAF had not been accorded sufficient respect and not enough of a big deal had been made. And, that uh, you know, as, as often is the case in peacetime, um, I think they're facing cuts. So he uh, peeled off and did some unusual things in order to make his point. First of all, he went and the, the phrase is beat up from a very low level over a couple of American air bases to annoy them. Um, and then he went and beat up the Houses of Parliament, by which I mean that he flew in his um, hawk carrier, um, uh, I think it was, um, hence the no hawker sign, 
uh, over London and circled the House of Commons three times uh, at extremely low altitude. Low enough altitude, in fact, lest you to drown out the debate in the chamber, which I swear to God was apparently on noise abatement laws at the time, and break some windows. Um, and having made his point, um, however slightly incoherent it was, he decided to head off home. Uh, and um, he headed off home. And if you know the geography of London, you know that if you sort of turn right at the Houses of Parliament as you come north and go down river extremely quickly, especially if you're flying in a fast <laughs> fighter jet, you come to Tower Bridge. So he's flying down the river in a sort of um, mood of fey belligerence and he sees Tower Bridge ahead of him and he says, you know, the idea immediately flashed into his mind, he wrote later, of flying under the upper span, uh, because Tower Bridge is two bridges, and, uh, or two, two, two spans, and he said no fighter pilot worth his salt could have resisted it. So he flew under fucking Tower Bridge in broad daylight in the middle of London. And, um, and Parliament decided to give lots more money to the RAF. <laughs> well, uh, it was a huge success. In fact, what happened was when he got, uh, got home, got out of his airplane, he got arrested. Court martialed, yeah, yeah, exactly, because that's insane and he should not be allowed near another well, machine. Well, funny you should say insane because he got um, uh, invalided out of the force, the no, grounds of mental I'm health. I feel bad. And he, he, he spent a, a lot of time uh, fighting that um, a, a assessment. I can't remember what happened in the end, but he said, you know, I did a, a stupid thing, but I wasn't. Um, I wasn't crazy. I wasn't crazy. Yeah. I did it on purpose. Uh, apparently only one person was hurt in the whole process. Um, and that was a um, uh, a gentleman who was cycling across the bridge. And went fell over. Flashed overhead and he fell off his bike <laughs> and tore his trousers. Uh, and Pollock later, later sent him the, the money to get his trousers repaired. <laughs> so extremely British story. But um, the other story about Al Pollock my mother tells is, is apparently he went into a casino in Gibraltar. Uh, when his father and I were down there and he took his wallet out of his pocket and threw it down um, on the table and said, put it on black. <laughs> My God. You didn't tell me if he won or not. <laughs> I think you have to have that sort of mindset if you're going to be an RAF pilot. You know, yes. you do have the kind of, just let's just go for the crazy thing. Well, then I think I will end, because we've got about to run out of time, I think I will end, um, unless you have other stories, with a uh, diplomatic story. I love this one. I think I know what you mean. Go well, on. Well, which one do you think I'm going to tell? Is it, is it Christmas? It is Christmas. It is. I thought this one would be the best, and there are many. So my father is a diplomat, and um, as far as I can tell, diplomacy is entirely responsible for the entire breadth of the English stereotype around the world, because all of it's true. Um, and there are lots of insider stories about um, ridiculous things going on uh, in diplomatic circles, although I would like to confirm that, in fact, I have never been offered a Ferrero Rocher, um, <laughs> ever. I'll get you one. Um within the diplomatic remit. I mean, I have eaten one. And then they're frankly underwhelming. I mean, get me a Snickers if you're going to get me anything. Um, but there is a story which allegedly is true, according to my father, um, which I think sums up uh, diplomacy pretty well. So it's the ambassador, um, the British ambassador to Mexico. And um, he's, he's out there doing his job and it's coming up to Christmas time and he gets a phone call from the local um, radio station. And they say, uh, Mr. Ambassador, um, we'd like to ask what you'd like for Christmas. Now, when you're a diplomat, certainly in the British diplomatic service, it's, giving and receiving gifts is a big deal. Hmm. Um, because on the one hand, uh, giving someone a nice gift or receiving one is a great way to foster a relationship. And diplomacy is all about building great relations so we can have wonderful conversations with people and be friends um, to make up for the fact that we have been awful in the past. And, um, but it's very important that this doesn't bleed into bribery. Because, of course, if, if, you know, Mexico decided to give the British ambassador a Jaguar and then mysteriously um, we made a nice deal with Mexico in the future, some people might point out that maybe that wasn't cool. So um, there are very strict rules about how big a present you can ask for and receive and otherwise it all gets a bit complicated. But, of course, you don't want to just say no because that's rude and might damage a relationship. So this poor ambassador sort of said, oh, hold on a minute. And he went back and had this sort of hurried conversation with his team about what would be the most appropriate thing to ask for because they wanted to ask for something and not be rude, but it could be too big and you know, what was it going to be like and eventually he came back and picked up the phone and he said um right we've had a talk um and i'd like um for christmas a um a small box of fruit <laughs> and the radio presenter said okay thank you very much mr ambassador um we'll be you know running a, a bit about this on christmas day so tune in then so the ambassador thinks fantastic and uh, goes about his duties and on christmas day does indeed tune in the radio program to hear this announcer um, say that they have, uh, you know, Merry Christmas, everyone. And they've asked a number of ambassadors what they would like for Christmas. And the French ambassador has asked for world peace. The American ambassador says he would like a cure for cancer. And the British ambassador says he would like a small box of fruit. 
And that, <laughs> in a nutshell, <laughs> is British diplomacy at its best. What's what's the phrase that your father says he's, is the strongest <laughs> terms he's allowed to use? If well, this is certainly I, I don't I bet it hasn't changed. Um, when he was training to be a diplomat or was junior diplomat and was, was being schooled, um, this must have been what in the eighties. Um, he was told that in a in a total crisis, and we're talking essentially, you know, nuclear war. You, mm-hmm. you are stationed as number one, the ambassador in a foreign country that has just gone to war with Britain. Mm. So Britain generally is down on nuclear war, particularly when it's against Britain. We don't like that, and our ambassadors are told that they shouldn't like it either. Um, but of course, we're we're very polite, and we're famous throughout the world as being kind of blundering and polite and sort of riff, 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 um, and very repressed, and we all are. Um, so literally, the strongest expression of condemnation my father was told he was ever allowed to make in the face of actual nuclear annihilation (laughs) was to go to whoever was in charge in the country where he was stationed and say this is a matter to which his majesty's government her majesty's government cannot remain indifferent (laughs) and that was like whoa defcon wine not (laughs) remain indifferent (laughs) but yeah be a diplomat good day to end on well, and, and I would like to, um, just before we do end, say, if anyone's listening, I'm sure you have stories similar to ours yes. in your past. Everybody's family is complicated and interesting, and there's always a, a sheep stealer and a hero and um, someone who has a wolf and a poisonous artefact in the basement. So if you have any stories like that, please do share them with us. Um, they're fascinating. Please do. So we will dig into them if we can find <laughs> diggableness. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for listening, everyone. Um, I don't think that was spooky at all, apart from the hat, really. So We're I'm not going to having a spooky day. Okay, in spite of us, have a spooky day. Mm-hmm.